Okay, I'll say it again. Thank you for being here. Great to see you, uh, a few faces in person, even half faces in person. It's better than no faces in person. Um, and I really want to thank uh, uh, my hosts here, Tiziano, Professor Marti, and Professor Innocenti. Um, it's wonderful to be in, in Siena. Uh, and I want to apologize at the start. I, I have a cold. I was tested twice. It's not COVID. Tested this morning, but it's still an annoyance. Um, OK. I'm going to cover four points. I want to talk about the institutional context, so where I'm coming from, where the research is coming from. Second, talk about the research and the methods. Third, talk about a little bit about what we've learned. And then finally, I hope we have some discussion and can go in greater depth. OK. Institutional context is three things. It's MIT, so my university. It's the Open Documentary Lab, uh, which is a, uh, well, we'll talk about it in a second. And the Co-Creation Studio, which is inside the Open Documentary Lab. And, uh, and I would say the Open Documentary Lab looks a lot at new forms of documentary, new media forms, immersive, location-based, uh, interactive. But often it looks at the texts and at the technologies. And the Co-Creation Studio really focuses on the people and the process and the methodologies. So that's kind of the, the difference that we'll see. So first of all, MIT. MIT is a, a university in Cambridge, uh, really Boston, I guess. If, if, uh, and it's a place that, that really tries to combine uh, intellectual inquiry with doing things. Men's and manas, mind and hand. It's got a really long and profound media history, a history of intervention, of, of foundational intervention in media. But most people would never think of, when you say media, maybe the media lab, but otherwise it doesn't get thought about with media very much. But if you look at the people on this play, page, um, Claude Shannon, who's the person who introduced the most basic media theory, kind of as an information theory in, in the 1940s, uh, bits and bytes, that's his language. Tim Berners-Lee, the uh, World Wide Web. Henry Jenkins, who, who founded the Comparative Media Studies Program, Convergence and Transmedia. Uh, Doc Edgerton up in the corner, Ricky Leacock, and Amar Bose. Bose is the guy for the headsets. All of them interested in precision. Precision of photographic representation, precision in the direct documentary movement, precision in acoustical terms. Norbert Wiener, Cybernetics. Um, Sherry Turkle, Second Life, Brewster Kale, The Wayback Machine, The Internet Archive, Chomsky, and it, it's an amazing place. And none of these people would probably say, maybe Henry Jenkins accepted, and Leacock, none of them would really say they're media people, but media is really core business to, to the research in a lot of sectors. Oh yeah, Technicolor, this always surprises me, Technicolor, is a, came from three MIT students back in back during the First World War. Okay, this then is the the Open Documentary Lab, and if you have any interest in documentary or uh, new forms, not anything except film and video, our lab probably does it, and our lab probably has resources that are maybe helpful for you. For example, there's an event every Tuesday. Six o'clock uh, Siena time, six in the afternoon. There's a lecture that's uh, a free lecture. Amazing group of people. Plus, we tape it all. So if you go here and you're interested in stuff on uh, immersive technologies or, or the latest the latest developments in haptic technologies, you can probably go to the events thing at the very top and find those uh, or videos. Sorry, go to videos and you can find the old videos. Anyway, I'm going to walk through a few of these things because these are really, really good resources. Um, first of all, what does the lab do? And I would say it sits at the middle of a lot of related practices, data-based stories, games, photo essays, installation work. Somewhere in the middle of that is the space we look at. 
And because it's a new space, an emerging space, the borders are soft. It's a very dynamic space. We work with a lot of partners, a lot of people that provide money, so foundations that provide money, a lot of festivals that are the showcases for new media work, a lot of producers like National Film Board or uh, Arte. Uh, and basically, I would say the function of our lab is to try to connect all of these groups, the people that give the money with the people that judge the results. We try to put them all at the same table and to create a conversation. My sense is that the best way to make the field evolve and to evolve quickly is to bring together the people that are making the decisions at all ends of the pipeline, from the money end to the festival end and everything in between. One of the other techniques we use is to, we have a, a, we have a group of people we call uh, fellows. So these are people that, that are with us for a year or two or sometimes longer. These are mostly makers, sometimes critics, sometimes theorists, mostly makers, who are really at the, the front edge of, the, of, of their work. And with them together, we meet every week and we develop a lot of prototypes and a lot of projects. One of the projects we developed uh, two years ago just won an Emmy this past year. That's a big deal. Uh, the, the, the really good work comes out of these uh, projects. Um, thanks to COVID, we were able to go international. So we have a couple of partners in, in Colombia, in Brazil, in Greece, in France, in Wales. Um, so it's become a, a bit more global than in the past. We have relationships with the broadcasters. Uh, um, so, so yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a pretty good mix of people, and they do amazing work. And for us, it allows us to kind of look at the process of creation. We can inform that process, but we can learn from that process. So that's, that's what we do with these folks. We also make a lot of tools. So if you go to our website, you'll see this project. And this project tries to argue... Um, it actually came, comes out of a lecture I gave to a group of television producers. The, the, America has a, a, the public broadcasting has a really a wonderful documentary series, mostly filmmakers. And I, I met with them to talk about, I was invited to talk to them about new technologies, about interactive, immersive, whatever. And I walked into a room full of mostly men, mostly arms crossed and legs crossed, men who did not want to hear about interactive. They were the director. They know how to make the film. What's, what's audience just has to sit there and enjoy it. And after I gave that talk, I thought, you know, I need to take all these buzzwords we use today, algorithmic and remix and interactive, and show that these actually have very deep histories, ancient histories. And that film is actually just a little bump Film and video is just a little bump in, our, in the bigger spectrum of, of media history. So for all of these terms, if you, if you go to this website, you can click through, and it tells the story of location-based media or remix media, but back hundreds of years. So that's, the point of this was to convince them that film is not the beginning or the end. It's just a little, little space in between. Another project we have is called DocuBase. And this is a kind of an online archive of interactive and immersive projects. So there are a couple of hundred different projects here. It's a pretty good search mechanism for them. And there's a, there's a series of playlists where you can find people who might be scholars, or might be technology developers, or might be programmers at festivals. And each one picks what they think are the most important works of the past 10 or 15 years. And you can link right to it from the website. Um, it's, it's, it's really a good resource, and the only problem we face is software keeps changing. So when Flash disappeared, so did 20% of our projects. So keeping up with the changing software versions is a challenge, but anyway, there's a lot of good stuff here if you're interested. <coughs> Finally, co-creation studio, <coughs> and the work today that I'll talk about comes from the co-creation studio. This is, the, this is the, the work that focuses on people, 
on methods, on process. One of the great things that, that these new technologies, even something as simple as this, has made possible is working together with people in new ways. Thinking about agency, and that's a word I'll come back to soon, in new ways. No longer do we just sit in front of the screen, we can actually produce content for the screen easily. Okay, maybe we could produce content for the screen 20 or 30 years ago easily with the video recorder. You couldn't distribute it. Now you can also distribute. So the, 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 the logics have changed a little bit uh, in terms of participation, and that's, that's really the, what the studio wants to look at. How can we push that to an extreme? How can we push that to be, to be more radicalized? Um, the lab has an artistic director, and she, and she is also the, uh, the uh, person who authored the book I'm going to talk about, Katerina Sizek. And Katerina is a multiple Emmy-winning filmmaker and uh, interactive maker. She's done a, a brilliant series for the National Film Board of Canada called High Rise. Before that, she was filmmaker in residence at the National Film Board of Canada, where she did path-breaking work. So her work is really central to, to, the, 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 uh, to the vision of the lab and also to the study that I'm going to talk about. The lab does a lot of things. In particular, it incubates projects. And that's where we learn a lot. We watch these projects take, you know, are born and develop, and, and we shape them, but we also learn from them. We also publish a lot of uh, papers. So for example, um, Just Joking. There's a human rights organization called Witness. Huh? Their, their business model has been to give cameras to people in areas where there are human rights abuses, and people can document those and upload them and the stuff is used in courts. What do you do with video documentation in an age of fake news? What do you do with video documentation of human rights abuses when the government says, that's fake? So together with Witness, we did a pretty extensive white paper called Just Joking, which uses the Donald Trump, uh, whenever you would catch Trump at a lie, you'd say, wait, wait, here's the proof, you lied. Ah, it was a joke. You know, that was the joke defense. Anyway, this looks at what's the legitimate space for deep fake in satire, but also how do we protect ourselves against deep fake if you want to use video as evidence. So it's a really interesting study, and it's beautifully presented. Uh, go to the website, click, and you're into it. Um, okay, jump over to what we actually do. And I guess the place to start is why, why even think about co-creation? What is it? And I would say really the, for me, and it's really why I'm, I'm so happy to be here with, with, uh, with, with uh, Tiziano and, and Professor Marti, Patrizia. Um, both of them in very different ways are interested in agency. Tiziano's work, some of his work anyway, that I, the, the work that I know the most about, is really looking at the agency of individuals in platform spaces where the algorithm is king and what about us, and really looking at how that the agency can push back and resist. And the work in Pat Pat Patrizia's lab uses, co I was so, so surprised that when I visited last, last week, it's exactly what we do. It's co-creation. It's work on disability. A lot of our work is also on, on uh, disability innovation. How, because of disability, if you think of it, most of our, some of our most basic media forms, the typewriter, the telephone, the phonograph, all of those were produced because of disability. The typewriter for blind people to be able to write, the telephone and phonograph both have histories connected to deafness. If we think of disability as actually a generator of innovation, a generator of new con concepts, it's a really powerful thing. It's not something that needs to be, accessibility is important, but there's something even bigger, and that's the innovation. Anyway, I was so delighted to see the, the work of the lab because it's very much like ours. So agency in that sense of working together with people to ask the right questions and to find the right solutions. So it's very much the kind of work that, that we do. So I'm just gonna talk today a little bit about our side of it. But really, crucially, this is about agency. Finding way to empower people 
in an age where maybe it's not so obvious. I would say really that co-creation is everywhere, but it's very hard to see. And it gets written over by, you know, if, if co-creation, think of where our languages came from. Is there an inventor of language? Think of where our great narratives came from, our folktale tradition. Think of where our great religions came from, the holy books that whatever culture on the world has. I mean, I know everyone says God wrote it, but actually he spoke to people and they, they did the work too. So when you look at these systems, these very rich and basic systems for our culture, these are produced by many. They're co-created. And what happened starting in the, in, you know, really the, the, the framework for this probably begins in the 15th century, but by the 17th century, the author is born, and with the author, the, the birth of the author, you know, Foucault notwithstanding, the birth of the author is also the birth of intellectual property. That I, the idea that ideas can be a property, that someone can own something that's, that's written or said, the prehistory of writing before the 16th century, it's often those names are attributed after the fact. The real history of authorship is often more collective than we think. And even in our era, in the, in, in, let's say even after the 16th, 17th century, if you think of painters like Rembrandt or painters like Jeff Koons today, that work is created by teams of people. One person's name is on it, it's one person's intellectual property, but in fact, it was a group effort. So I think a lot of human collaboration gets overwritten by the cult of the author, and especially in a capitalist culture, the cult of ownership. And what we try to do with this co-creation project is to make visible other dynamics, alternatives to individual control and individual authorship. Nothing wrong with it, it's a great thing, but there is also another tradition, and so we're trying to make that tradition a little more visible. So basically, I would say, what's, why do we do this? It's about rethinking agency in an age of epistemological crisis. And by epistemological crisis, I mean, you just have to look at a newspaper to know there is COVID. No, there's not COVID. Italy is maybe the wrong place to say this. People are so, at least, at least Siena, people are so um, mindful of wearing masks. And, but in the States, it's a political issue. There are stores that say you can't enter with a the, with the, with the mask because it's all fake. Wow, that's basic. There are people dying every day from this thing. And there are, you know, there's, a, there's a debate about whether it's real or not. When I say epistemological crisis, what I mean is that we're facing a series of challenges today where one person is not probably the answer. So for example, COVID-19, we have something that's so novel we have, a, we have a viral form, you know, it's a, no, it's a, it's a, it's a novel virus. It's a, it's a virus we don't have experience with. How, in, how can you do something that's going to save humanity without a lot of people jumping on with a lot of ideas? One person is not going to solve this problem. Problems... Today, some of our problems have incredible complexity with them. So I would say in the United States, an issue like racial, racial justice or, or disability justice or whatever justice, um, those are very complex issues. Deep histories, complicated histories, not an easy way to fix them. People have very, they're born into these problems and it's very hard to separate yourself from them. Who is going to fix that? And I would say that requires a rethinking of agency. That requires a lot of us to be involved. There's not a way, yeah, even in framing the question, let alone answering the question, it takes multiple people. It takes different kinds of expertises together. Scale. Something like climate crisis is a great example of a, of a, of a problem, the scale of which is enormous. Everything we do is involved in this, and there are trade-offs with everything we do. So again, it's not, a, it's not a, a problem that has an easy fix, and it's certainly not a problem that, has, that one person is going to answer. Trust, and that's what I just opened with. You know, how, is the, did this happen, or is it fake news? That, did, is Ukraine busy invading Russia, or is Russia busy invading Ukraine? 
depends which newspaper you read. How do, you solve, how do we solve that today? How do we solve the problem of social media where you can, where basically sensation is what gets boosted to the top by the algorithms? Is it a better educational process? Is it, you know, what, what's the fix? And what we try to look at that through the lens of co-creation, maybe if we're involved in building these systems together, we have better insights into what the trade-offs are and how we want to skew these systems. Maybe people have a better understanding of how they work. And finally, I would say co-creation helps with the framing of issues in the sense that a lot of what is driven by a capitalist economy is a primary concern about what's next. Not about what happened, not looking at history for bigger patterns, not learning from history, but really just worried about next and profit optimization. But with a bigger frame, whether in terms of thinking across cultures or thinking across history, you can situate problems in quite different ways. So co-creation, I'm going to argue, and we'll come back to this at the end, uh, can be a useful way to take on these enormous uh, challenges that we face today. <coughs> and so just an example to begin. Um, you may or may not remember that when COVID came out, uh, there were initially projections about how long it would take to come up with a vaccine. And typically, it would be a two to four year window. It takes a while to develop it. It happened pretty quickly. And it happened very quickly for a couple of reasons. Number one, uh, in China, um, a virologist, um, I have to look at the name here, Yong Chen Zhang, broke an embargo and released, he released the genetic code. The Chinese cracked a lot of the genetic code, and he released it to the world. And that meant that suddenly, not just Chinese researchers, but global researchers had the code, saved them an enormous amount of time, and they could really get to work on then trying to take the next step. So that was a big deal. Secondly, uh, two of the pioneers of CRISPR technology, so gene editing uh, technology, uh, Jennifer Dunda and Feng Zhan, had been fighting each other in the courts over whose approach to CRISPR, you know, are you stepping on my intellectual property? Am I taking your intellectual property? There were endless court battles about who owned this technology. When COVID broke, they both said, okay, enough. Let's work together. Let's, let's open up our technology so other people can use it. Forget the fight. Let's solve this problem. Where I work at MIT, we closed the university, except anyone who had any possible way of imagining approaching the, the, the COVID problem, the doors were open and resources were available. So people from all different disciplines came together. So one of the ways that, that we came up with a, a, a vaccine for the, for the uh, virus so quickly was through a kind of co-creation. It's not to say that there were not abuses. There were abuses. It's not to say that people didn't try to make money from this. People tried to make money. But in general, the fundamental breakthrough happened because people collaborated in, in ways they had never collaborated before across disciplines, across countries, across organizations. And that's really valuable. And when I think about it, one of the things that makes MIT, where I work, a, a, a really interesting place, happened in the 19, happened during the Second World War, during the, during the late 30s, 40s. And what happened was um, two people whose names were on that panel I showed you, Vannevar Bush, who did the Memex machine, basically the desktop computer but before really they had very good computers. But he, he understood the desktop model. Vannevar Bush was, I guess, president of the university. And then he stepped over to government to help with government research. And uh, Norbert Wiener, the developer of cybernetics, Wiener was a famous guy for, you know, here, here at the end of the day, what, what is it, the passaggio? You, you walk around and check everyone out at the end of the day. Wiener used to do that. He'd walk through all the halls at MIT smoking a cigar stop in and see what the biology people were doing, see what the psychologists were doing, check out the design department, stop off in chemistry. He's a mathematician, but he was very interested in all these other things. When the war started, Vannevar Bush goes to government 
has an opportunity to send a lot of money to MIT. And what MIT did that was really distinctive was that it worked across disciplines. It worked, all the disciplines worked together to develop something like cybernetics, which works, with, you know, it's, it's something that works in psychology and biology and, and uh, engineering. They really started to work in this deeply interdisciplinary way to solve problems of, I don't know, military problems. But that breakthrough really made MIT just, just they leapt ahead in terms of innovation. Because when you're in your own little silo, what you do is often very predictable. You grow in increments. But when you jump outside and, and try to shift your paradigm, radical things happen. So what happened here with the, with the COVID case it actually has a kind of a parallel history in what happened. At MIT, it was called the RAD lab. Uh, it was the radar lab. But, but that, that's where this kind of innovation had a precedent. Um, anyway, co-creation is a very curious word because it's not, in, at least in the English language, the, the, the Bible of, of the language, the Oxford English Dictionary, it's not in there, which is curious because they're usually very quick to get new words. But if you go to Google Ngram, I don't know if you, it's kind of skewed towards English, so maybe you don't use this so much. But it's a great way to track the deep history of word usage. You can see how often a word has been used, you know, in the, it goes way back, much deeper than 1900. It goes back to like 1800 or so. Any published source, you just put it in Google Ngram and you can see how that word has been used or compare words. Actually, the word has quite a history. And uh, <coughs> so it's curious that it's not in uh, Ngram. And best of all, with Google, when you do this, you can take any decade, and you can see right there on the page are all the citations. You can just read it. The sources are right there. So it's, a, it's not just a graph, an abstract graph. All the sources that are making this graph are there on the, on the up, uploaded for your use. So it's a word with a rich history, and it's kind of curious that it's, that it's missing, but, I, but it says a lot, actually. So here's a definition. I don't know if it's legible to you, so I'll read it. Co-creation offers alternatives to a single author vision. It's a constellation. We talk about it mostly in media terms. A constellation of media methods, frameworks, and feedback systems. And here's what's important. Projects emerge out of process and evolve from within communities and with people rather than being made for them or about them. If you think of how most filmmakers work, documentary makers, there's a problem and you want to make a film about it. There's some people that are having a bad time and you want to help them, so you make a film for them. Here we argue the, the media production has to happen with people. The very conception has to be with from the outset. Co-creation also spans across disciplines, organizations, and even beyond them, and can involve non-human systems. Co-creation ethically reframes who creates, how, and why. Co-creation interprets the world, seeks to change it with a commitment to equity and justice. Those last words you might hear a little bit of Karl Marx in those. Our job is not to interpret the world, but to change it. But I think our job as academics is not to interpret the world, but to actually do something. So our project, our research agenda, was bro broken into four parts. Two of them are related. Uh, so one was looking at co-creation in community settings. Community in face-to-face -face sense and community in online sense. Then we also looked at co-creation within organizations, so maybe across disciplines or across yeah, organizations. And then we looked at, in a speculative way, but a really interesting way, co-creation with non-humans. And in particular, we looked at co-creating with biological systems, a slime mold, termites or ants. Um, there are people that do that, and it's amazing work. Or with artificial intelligence. How can we co-create with AI systems? And I'll give a few examples of that. Uh, in fact, well, okay, I'll just give a few examples of each of these as we go through. Basically, what we did was a, a field study um, where we interviewed a lot of people, about 100 people, actually 166 in the end. We focused a lot on media makers, 
media in a broad sense, like new media makers, but also a lot of artists. That was the sector we focused on. We did uh, extensive interviews with people, had a lot of workshops, uh, regular workshops where we would develop projects and watch how these methods work, what, what, work, what works, what doesn't work. A lot of problems. This is not a perfect methodology. Incubated a lot of projects and kept fixing and refining our idea. We worked with a lot of different types of people, so media scholars, documentarians, placemakers, people that really... So yeah, so we work with a lot of different kinds. You can see them up there. Students, journalists, movement builders, researchers of all kinds. And we made a book. And the book is coming out this November. Um, we just sent in the final versions of the, of the, uh, the proofs. So there you can see it's Kat Cizek and myself. And a, and a bunch of other co-authors who were crucial to making this book what it is. Um, but if you want a preview of the book, if you want to see like 80%, 70% of the book, first I'm going to give you a... Tr working with a filmmaker is great. So, so Kat, I said, is a documentary maker. And if you write a book with a filmmaker, this is what you get. A trailer. the trailer huh okay and basically this just speaks to iteration our idea is that we take what we've learned we present it to people we use that to shape the work they're doing and hear from them what they want to do interact see what comes out of it learn from that keep cycling through the process um, I already mentioned but this is co-creation as we understand it is really the, the deepest of human practices. It's how we have always done things. And really, I would say it's like something like an economic order that's based on the ownership and control of ideas, capitalism, intellectual property regimes, all that stuff, is really where this starts to change. What that means is that there are still cultural spaces, often non-Western, where co-creation is still alive. Or there are parts of Western culture, often the margins, communities of, of poor people, people not part of the system, where co-creation is really part and parcel of what they practice. In the United States, indigenous people, huh, the, 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 native, uh, the Native American, uh, the, the first the people that were there before the white people came, often have modes of, of co-creativity that are, are persistent. So it's around, it's just not part of mainstream capitalist Western culture. Uh, and so we tried to learn from, from those lessons. We tried to learn from those past practices. And, uh, uh, and as I already said at the front end, co-creation offers an alternative to single author. It's not about that there's nothing wrong with the single author. I am a proud single author. I've written a lot of stuff, and I'm happy that my name's on it. Attribution is really crucial. That's an important part of how our academy is built. It's, it's great, but there is another tradition, and that's what we're trying to look at. And not that one is better or worse, but it's both. Both of them uh, uh, together constitute a, a richer culture. There are such rich practices. So this is a, <clears throat> a phenomenon in the United States from the 19th century, maybe even 18th century. Building a barn, building a barn to keep animals in, that's a, that's a big job. And most farmers, certainly in the, in, in the old days, did not have the money 
or the resources to do that. And a common practice, this was called a barn raising, people from the neighbor, all the neighbors would come together and for a couple of days, a week or two weeks, they would work on one farmer's barn. And it's a community building exercise. It helps to establish you know, a pretty, pretty significant piece of architecture. But the knowledge about this, that's what's so interesting. The plans, it's not like they hired in plans from an architect. This was embedded knowledge in the community with some people understanding design, some people understanding woodworking craft, other people understanding the assembly process. It took a lot of different skills for a community to come together and build this. And this is a really good example of co-creation. A lot of other ones, I mean, I don't know that I have them here. Uh, here's a more recent one. This is National Film Board of Canada. So Canada has, it's the world's largest film producer, uh, National Film Board. And um, in the 60s and 70s, they had a, a, a movement called Challenge for Change. The Challenge for Change wanted to change the approach of documentary film. A little bit like I already talked about. Rather than making films about people, or for people, they wanted to make films with people. And if you think about the 60s and 70s, especially the 70s, it's right when the video camera breaks through. They're still expensive, but they're, you can shoot with video. So what this, <coughs> what, sorry. what this film movement did, would, this is an example in uh, Fogo Island. Fogo Island was like a fisherman's island that was poor, really poor. And the government was trying to get people to leave the island. They just basically wanted to get these people off the island and save money. Filmmakers went there and taught the people how to, how to shoot. They said, wait, what are your problems? We're going to show you how film works. And meanwhile, what's important to you? What do you want to fix? What do you want to change? What do you want to document? And the community and the filmmakers worked together. with, com And that's what you see in this picture, a woman from the community filming a, an interview. And a lot of interesting things happened. So for, for starters, the people spoke in a pretty strong accent. And they realized when they filmed one another, this doesn't, who's going to understand this? Like we have to, we have to communicate a little more clearly if we want someone else to understand this. They understood how to look more poised on camera. They weren't ner they learned to not be nervous and to, to look okay on camera. They would take the cameras with them to meetings with their politicians and film what the politicians would say. And then go back and, uh, you know, and, conf and later con they would film the politicians saying one thing, film them saying another thing, and then confront the politicians. And basically, they were able to change the government's position. They didn't, this was not a film, the, the films they made were not for many, very many people to see. They were mostly for the government to see, and it changed the government's position. So this was a really good example of a community working with filmmakers to try and understand what's the goal, how do we achieve the goal, let's do it. And it's a, it's a really rich history of that. So this is the team. We, the team changes a lot because there's always people coming and going, but this is one version of it. Our team at the co-creation studio. Um, this is the kind of stuff we do. So this is a big project. It, it says 2020 there, but it's still happening now, where we work with a, a group of indigenous uh, technologists and artists. So these are, these are mostly people, from, uh, First Nations people from Canada. Um, so for example, there's a, uh, in this group is a star reader, an indigenous, a uh, First Nations person who looks at the stars and can interpret things. And we've put that person in dialogue with the Nobel winning astronomer, Nobel Prize winning astronomer at MIT, and it clicked, it totally clicked. These guys found, they, the, the stargazer, the star watcher knows a lot about the stars. And uh, together, new ideas started to come up. So basically, we tried to match indigenous artists and technologists with specialists at MIT. The MIT side was happy to do it. 60 different professors jumped on board to help. And it's a rich series of collaborations have been coming out of this. That's a space for co-creation. 
yeah, that, that's what our working space is like. Uh, here's another good example. This was a team from Bolivia, some indigenous people from Bolivia, who were making a, um, they wanted to make a robot devil. So they were making a, they were making a VR installation about uh, in, in, in imprisonment, long-term imprisonment of indigenous people. And to, to do on the front end of the, as for the installation, they wanted a, an AI-driven robot devil that could watch people and interact with them. And the robot needed working hands, and it needed to have uh, be able to see things and recognize things. If someone wasn't dancing, the robot should be able to say, hey, you, you in the black shirt, you're not dancing. That's a big challenge. Um, so we, we, they came up to MIT. They brought the devil's head. And then we started to meet with all kind of engineers, the engineers that specialized in, in hands. We worked with a $70,000 hand. And these guys figured out a way to do it much more cheaply. What was so interesting was that the questions they were asking were different questions than the engineers would ever, of course, would ever ask. Engineers never made a, a robot devil before. But together, they started to learn. They, they came out in a third space where both sides benefited. Uh, this project has gone on to, to, to do amazing things. The tip for the image recognition it was a good, a good tip from the uh, machine learning, the machine vision specialists. Fake it. First fake it, then you'll know what you need. Don't, don't try to come up with a system that sees everything too complicated. Fake it, see what you really need, and then build that. That's a good, good tip. In doing the book, uh, we worked with a lot of different groups. And this is a, a useful example. This is a group called Detroit Narrative Agency. Detroit, as you may know, was a, is a major American city where they make all the cars came from Detroit. But then it collapsed. And this, this, the, the, the business kind of dropped out of the car. The car business dropped. And Detroit, the city tends to be black and poor, and a lot of the houses are destroyed. It's, it's, it's abandoned, and it's a mess. It's really a mess uh, from one perspective. And from another perspective, it's evidence of a kind of crime of the, what the wealthy people did. They took all the money out, and they left the, 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 the people who lived there with nothing, basically. So this, this community has been really busy to kind of rebuild and, uh, on its own terms. And so Detroit Narrative Agency is one of, the, one of the community groups that brings together all kind of people, trans and gay and, and you know, activists, different kinds of activists, together to change the story of Detroit, to talk about a narrative that's not a narrative of, as I just described it, a, 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 a city in decay, but rather a city full of potential and creativity, a city that is re, re, being born again and going somewhere. We wanted to work with them because they're a really good example of co-creation. And to do that, they, 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 they're so experienced in this space, they said, look, so you're just another bunch of white people that are going to come in, take our ideas, put them in your book, and then say goodbye. Uh-uh, it doesn't work that way. And it doesn't work that way. That's correct. And that was really good to hear and because they share the same views we share. So we, we worked a lot with them on, on how, how to co-design the research. We gave them co-author credit on the, on the book um, because they deserved it. They, they constitute their, we learned so much from them, and they contributed so much to the book. Uh, we came up with a, a community benefit agreement, how to make clear at the outset what the working relationship will be. That's crucial because otherwise, misunderstandings can happen, and you have problems. So this has been a very, very important group to our project. They really, without them, our project wouldn't be possible. We learned a lot from them. And together, we're a really powerful partnership. Here's a project. This is a, it's an installation, but it's also an online project, uh, interactive project. It has many different forms called Question Bridge. And it's a documentary about being black and being male. It's a tough, at least in a country like the U.S., that's a tough, uh, that's a tough position to occupy. Um, as you know from the headlines, the endless black males that get killed just because. 
And what's so wonderful about this project, a good example of co-creation, where a lot of people work together with a community of black men to say, how do we tell this story? From whose perspective? And what they did is brilliant. I, I've forgotten the number now, but let's, they had maybe 80 or 90 men from all over the country, from different ages, from different wealthy and not wealthy. And these men got in front of a video camera and asked questions that they wanted to ask another black man. And then that video of these questions would go to another black guy who would have his questions, but he would answer some questions. And so this is basically asynchronous question and answer. So you'll, you'll see a businessman, a black businessman saying, answering the question, you know, why, why don't black kids have a, a, a place in the job market? And the black banker will say, I'll tell you why. Because you always wear those funny clothes, those baggy pants, and this crazy, that, wear a normal clothes, wear a suit, you know, you'll get a job. And another, another black person will answer the same question saying, it's discrimination, you know, it's, a, it's but there'll be maybe 10 different answers to each question that reflect the diversity of black males, the diversity of their speaking positions. So both in terms of the questions and the answers, it was really a collaborative effort, and it was something you could never do face to face. It would be, it'd be a fight, it'd be an argument, it'd be, a, it'd be messy. But asynchronously, it was brilliant. A uh, project in, uh, uh, on, on Peru, Fujimori, the president of Peru, forcibly sterilized hundreds of thousands of indigenous women. This is a project that tries to tell the story of those indigenous women that they tell, that they think is important. But how do you take in, indigenous women from the countryside and connect them to us? And they did it with a really simple, really simple phone technology. Um, where they could aggregate these, these phone messages of, of women telling their stories, of people sending answers back. It's called Quipu, which is a, a Peruvian beaded necklace. And this uses that structure to, to weave together stories from the community for the bigger world. Panama Papers would be more of an institutional co-creation. The last ones were all community-based. This is maybe more institutional. I'm sure you've all heard of the Panama Papers, but what's remarkable is 107 normally competing news organizations work together to make this happen. It couldn't happen with one organization. And we've seen a bunch of examples since that are, that are, that are, that are doing this. Um, okay. This is one of, of kind of a curious uh, example. Um, of an artist and a scientist where each one learns something. The artist, uh, Gina Zarnacki, Zarnacki, wanted to make, uh, those, are, those are molds of her, she has a couple of daughters, and those are molds of her daughter's faces. And she wanted to, to have these faces be covered with uh, human skin, the skin from her daughters. And she didn't want to take the skin off her daughters. That, that, that was not the idea. She wanted to grow the skin, take a cell, couple of cells, grow the cells, grow the skin, and then have the skin cover the mask. So she went to all these scientists like John Hunt. She went to a bunch of skin, people that grow skin, you know, for people that were in accidents or fires, and um, said, you know, here's my project. I, I want to grow some skin. And um, I want to grow it vertically, up and down. And the scientist said, no, no, no. You, the way we grow it, we grow it flat. And she said, no, I want to grow it vertically. And they said, well, no. You, you, know, you don't know anything about this. Go away. Finally, in John Hunt, she found a, she found a skin uh, specialist who said, it's not the way we do it, but I'll try. And he tried, and it worked. And better, discovered that the skin has a different kind of elasticity when it grows vertically instead of horizontally. It actually was a scientific breakthrough that would not have happened if the artist hadn't come in with a with a, a certain point of view. So this would be a good example of two people that are each learning from each side. Each one is learning. Each one is compromising. Each one is pushing the other. And in the end, they come up with something that would not have been there before. 
Another really interesting example, the uh, Stephanie Dinkins is, a, is an artist who uh, works with AI a lot, artificial intelligence. And in this case, she, she, got a, she came across this Bina. Bina was a, a robot that uh, a trans woman made of her wife, uh, the, the most highly paid woman in the biopharmacy industry in the, whatever 2018 turns out to be trans. There's like there's always a man somewhere, that, but there's that's the wrong way to say it. Um, anyway, this was a model made of the wife Bina, and. Stephanie Dinkins thought it kind of looked a lot like her too. She's also a black woman, the, the, the wife of, uh, of the developers of black woman. So she started to program this thing with herself. She started to, A, it came programmed, so it was programmed for someone else. But she had these long conversations with this, with this robot that has really, it's an AI system, and started to have that, develop that, that middle space where who, who is this entity that's emerging? Is this part of me? Is this, am I authoring this? Am I, are my words being recast by the AI in the system? It's, it's one of these great ways to ask questions about an AI system. Uh, a mirror that distorts, but in distorting, you can see the shape of the mirror. And so Stephanie has done wonderful work in AI in, in many different sectors. Uh, but this is one of our really most striking projects and a great example of working with the AI as a partner, not as a tool, not as, a, not as an instrument, but actually as, as, a, as an equal, as someone that, that she is, is, is learning from and also shaping. Su Gwen Chung, another AI artist who, uh, who also talks about... Um, The relationship that we usually have with machines is, is computers is like something like a master slave. And that's what she's trying to get away from. She's trying to find a way to learn from the machine just as the machine learns from her. So in, in her case, the, she's, the, program, the, the computer has been programmed with her drawings. She's a visual artist. So the, the, the computer has learned her way of drawing. But it does it differently. And so they draw together and they shape one another's, they're constantly like programming each other in a sense. Um, and basically what she's trying to do is challenge the whole idea of authorship and to, to, to try to argue, the, the, to try to articulate this space in between. Um, so what did we learn from all this? And I'm gonna warn you now, it's a lot of words. If you go to that, if you go to the uh, Collective Wisdom uh, online book, all of this stuff is there explained, but I'll just give you a few of the headlines. Um, <coughs> especially in terms of the lessons and the risks. So, <coughs> lessons, you know, deep listening and dialogue are crucial. Hearing what people really want is not an easy thing. Often we walk in with our own ideas and we hear what people say that connects with our ideas and we don't hear what we don't want to hear. And, and deep listening is way more complicated. Uh, uh, I've learned a lot. I'm not, not saying I've mastered it. Having common principles, being clear about what you agree about and what you don't agree, agree about. Having consent and community benef uh, agreements. Working out in advance what each group expects and wants and will do. How much time each group is willing to commit. I'm sure in some of your work with disability uh, folks, you know, you really have to understand that before, before getting into it. Um, process and outcomes, that's a really important one too. Often, you know, these projects have outcomes, but the process is really the part you learn from. The process of doing the thing yields 90% of the, of the benefit. And the outcome is, it's okay. It's sometimes very useful, but it's not always where the action is. And we're so product oriented, we're so outcome oriented in our culture that that's, that can be an easy thing to miss. Complex narrativity. Um, anyway, you could go to this, you go to the website and you can walk through all of these with some explanation. But there's, 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 I would say this, these 10 points really distill what we've 
what we came out of the many different interviews we had. That said, there's also some risks, and the risks are very real. So one of the risks is, what do you do with editorial integrity and artistic independence? If you want to make a statement, but someone in the group disagrees, you know, it's like the EU, and, and Poland disagrees, or Hungary disagrees, and everything goes, goes a bit flat. Sometimes consensus is not so good uh, for having a, taking a clear stand and being independent. So that's, a, that's an important thing to weigh. Maybe co-creation is not right for the project, if those are the goals. Um, sometimes people can expect too much. I mean, we, we had that all the time. A big university like MIT walks into a community and says, we're here to help and do something, and we want to listen to you. At first, people don't really believe it. And then when they start to believe it, they really get hopeful. They have a lot of problems. They know we have come from a very rich university. We don't, we don't, we're not rich, but the university is. But their expectations can, be, can, can, be, can lead to disappointment. So you have to be very, very careful about keeping the scale of expectations accurate and, 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 and realistic. Uh, Unintended consequences. So there, there have been a number of AI endeavors where people have worked together with computers, uh, with AI systems to program them, but the results have been disastrous because of the more you open things up to a public, the more someone somewhere is going to use it abusively and it gets hurtful to people. Um, you know, point five on marginalization of makers. If you're not the artist whose name is on the bottom, what are you? Oh, I'm someone who worked on the project. That's like a that you're, you're sometimes in a culture that privileges the artist star. Co-creation can actually be not so good for your career, so that's a thing to be to be aware of, and it's especially a thing to be aware of, um, you know, for for communities of color. It can also be a way to steal ideas. And co-creation right now in English is a bit of a buzzword. A lot of companies are now starting to use the word, uh, come, co-create with us, when really what it is is a harvesting operation. They're trying to scoop in the ideas that they take and make money on, turn into intellectual property, and your idea is gone. So it's, you know, it, it has to be dealt with carefully. Um, and. Point seven is in that direction as well. It's easy to sort of co-opt this, to take it as a marketing concept. It's a feel-good marketing concept, but actually people aren't really consistent about it. So this is not a cure-all. It's not a panacea. It's not a perfect thing. It has to be dealt with carefully, responsibly, uh, and that's kind of what this is about. And basically, what is co-creation? It's a spectrum. It's a spectrum of behaviors, and I would say good co-creation is kind of in the middle there, but you see the two extremes. One is your uh, a community is, is helping a media maker, a filmmaker wants to make a project and needs a community. That, that's one extreme, and the other extreme is the community needs some visibility for a project. They want to make a problem visible, so they pull in a filmmaker. Neither of those is really optimal. There's, 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 part, there's collaboration in both cases, but it wouldn't be co-creation. Co-creation is maybe more somewhere in the middle. Co-creation requires rethinking traditional leadership roles. Like what used to be the director, or what used to be the producer, or what used to be the leader, is now a guide, or a facilitator, or a curator, or an ego manager. That's... that's the, <laughs> A cat herder, it's a tough one. So as I said at the outset, um, what, you know, what is this leverage? What does this do for us? And I think working together with a lot of different people, with a lot of different expertises, a lot of different stakes in a space, helps us to figure out new spaces quickly. Rather than one person coming in and saying, this is what it is, you can really better understand the, the, the potentials of a new space, of an uncharted territory, by having multiple inputs. It's a great way to confront power systems. Power is always top down, and this helps us to kind of better and more resourcefully confront that. 
one person against the power system is not going to work. But working across communities or across organizations or across disciplines can really generate some power. Some power Helps to address complexity, as I've already mentioned. Deals with time differently. And can be a, <coughs> a great way to deal with this polarization that we're finding. This, when people don't trust things, when people have a problem with journalists and they don't trust the newspaper, it's fake news. The more a community is involved in the construction of its news, the less there is to mistrust. The more you understand the process, the more you understand the inputs, the more you understand the, the rationale behind what's there. So one, to, it strikes me, you know, the the the, the great the great um, theorist uh, uh, of, of journalism, um, James Carey, he makes a really powerful distinction between. He says, "What's communication?" Most theories of communication focus on transmission. It's how do I get what I know to you? And how do I get it with a minimum amount of noise? So right now we have linguistic noise. I'm speaking English, you speak Italian. It's not the best. Better if I spoke Italian. Or better if you spoke you know, English like a native or something. But we don't have that. There's a little noise in the system. Most communication theory from the 1940s, from Claude Shannon onwards, is really interested in the transmission of information. But Kerry says there's another side to, uh, to communication that we, we overlook, and that's ritual. And ritual is, is, the, is about the exchange of information. Ritual is about the collaboration of an information space. Ritual is what happens, I don't know if it happens here, but maybe it does, at, at, at the, at the, over a coffee where people say, hey, I read this, well, I read that, well, I read something else, and together, you start to construct something you know, from the collective. For Kerry, that's really, really important. And I would say, you know, if you look at our, our media ecosystem today, what's happening? The newspapers, perfect examples of transmission, right? They, they, they have professionals, trained professionals who collect the news, write the news, it's edited and sent to you every day. Newspapers are in a state of collapse right now. In 2014, the Washington Post, maybe the second most important paper in the US, was bought by Amazon's Jeff Bezos. The whole deal was a bunch of other companies, quarter of a million. The, the newspaper itself, $60 million for America's number two newspaper. That same year, Mark Zuckerberg, Facebook, bought WhatsApp. $19. $1.9 billion, with a B. $60 million or $19 billion. If you do a data visualization and you have a circle that's, that's $19 billion, $60 million is a pencil stripe. It's nothing. And what's WhatsApp? Pure ritual. Nothing except a linkage system between people. Zero content until people start to provide it. Transmission model, 60 million. Ritual model in its industrial form, 19 billion. So it's funny to me that Carrie, Carrie's idea of ritual has not penetrated the newspaper world, that it's still about experts telling you what to think. And now that more and more people have this, this epistemological thing where they don't even believe it, it strikes me as a great case. Like what co-creation is, 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 it's heavy on the ritual side. It's about collaboration. It's about working together. It's about combining knowledge, combining perspectives, combining resources. Something like that could be, would be a very interesting, have a very interesting place in the world of journalism if we want to keep it a vital part of our ecosystem. So, so that's just to say, it's a public good, civic trust, the commons. That's a space where this, this kind of coming together can be really, really powerful. I think that's it.